again, I hope you're enjoying the nice weather, but I hope you're glad to be here this morning. And again, I have to ask you to go ahead and we'll stand and we'll sing Be Still My Soul. Be still my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide. Thy best I have thee, friend, through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future as he the past, thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake, all thou mayst yes, shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. for opening prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord, the day that you have made, Lord, just for us to be able to come aside and uh, come together as a body, Lord, and to worship you and to hear from your word. Lord, I pray you just um, quiet our hearts and our minds upon you, Lord, that we'll just get rid of all the distractions and instead focus, focus ourselves upon you. Lord, we thank you um, for the baptismal service that we're going to have Later, Lord, we just thank you for that testimony. And Lord, I pray that everything just brings you honor and glory. I pray you be with Pastor as he preaches your word. Fill him with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Just allow him to be a mouthpiece for you, Lord, so that we might be made closer to the image of your Son. And for someone here who is not saved, I pray that today will be the day they call upon you for salvation, the day where they accept the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son. And Lord, we thank you for that which you've done, and we thank you for that which you continue to do. We pray for these things in your Son's name. Amen. You may be seated. Praise 
you're able to stand, would you join me in standing for our next song, The Haven of Rest. My soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, make me your choice, then I entered the haven of rest. I anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. The tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word my fetters fell up and I anchored my soul the haven of rest is my Lord I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest, I'll sail the wide seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm safe evermore. Oh, so come to the Savior, He paid. Saved by his power divine. Come anchor your soul in the haven of rest and say, My beloved is mine. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the wide no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus, I'm saved evermore. Amen. You may be seated. All right, before I get into the announcements, uh, to my announcements, I just want to publicly thank everyone who uh, was so uh, sacrificially giving during Pastor's Appreciation Month from the uh, money offerings to the gift card to the special dinner. It just means a lot to my wife and I, and we just want to publicly thank you guys for everything. We just love it here. We love serving the Savior with you guys. So a uh, few quick announcements. Uh, first of all, coming up next Saturday is uh, Blast Rally at Friendship Baptist Church. We are leaving at 10 a.m. Also, on uh, for the month of November, we will have Bible study on November the 8th, and then the second, uh, that next Tuesday that we would originally have it is uh, the week of Thanksgiving, so we're going to do it after the week, uh, so the, on the 29th will be, um, so the 8th and 29th will be our two Bible studies for the month of November. Also, uh, men, uh, for the, we have the men's conference on Monday, on, in Muncie, that's on January 14th, that's Saturday. It is a uh, free event, um, and we found out this past Tuesday at our pastor's fellowship that Pastor John Wilkerson out of First Baptist Hammond is going to be the speaker there. And also, uh, February 9th through 11th is snow camp. And if you have any questions, please see me about that. Those are my announcements. I'll give it back to Pastor. Let me uh, give you a little bit of update on Pastor Bond. I had mentioned Wednesday night to the folks that were here uh, that how well he was doing and is up and walking and everything after having a six, byway, a six bypass surgery on his heart. 
I get home from church Wednesday night, my son had texted me and they took him to the emergency room. He's in ICU at this time. Uh, he has bl internal bleeding. They're not sure where. He has two tests tomorrow to see if they can figure out where the bleeding is coming from. But he is not doing well at this time. So if you'd pray for Pastor Bond and Grace Baptist Church in Muncie, I know that they would appreciate that, okay? Uh, his wife uh, obviously could use prayer along with the family. Um, again, anytime somebody is hurting, uh, the spouse is doing just as bad, if not worse at times. So if you'd pray for the Bond family, I know that they would appreciate that. Pastor Burt is doing well to my knowledge. I think he was planning on being in church this morning. Uh, I'll know more that the afternoon, obviously, to see, but uh, he was planning on being in church this morning. So they appreciate your prayers. Uh, both of them had mentioned that, but I, I thank you for doing that. Two things let me give you before I give you what's in the bulletin that are not in the bulletin. Those that are in the Faith Bible Institute. The registration stuff is up and going finally. Uh, Miss Misty would be glad to help you with that tonight if you want to come uh, during the choir practice perhaps or whatever. She'll be glad to help you with that. Or Monday night at 5 o'clock before class starts, she'll be glad to help you get things signed up for those who are doing uh, the Faith Bible Institute. For many of us, again, this will be our last semester, so you need to be uh, make sure you register so you can graduate and things as well. And then November the 20th, it's two weeks, three weeks from today, uh, is we'll have our Thanksgiving dinner here at the church. And again, to remind you about that, the church will bring the turkey if you'll bring a dish to pass. And then we'll have an early afternoon service, and that early afternoon service is made up of just a special music. So those of you who are involved and would like to do some special music, you need to let Brother Joe know that so we can sort of get a, line, a lineup put together for that afternoon service on November the 20th, okay? Other things coming up again, as you see, every Wednesday is a Bible study and prayer meeting, kids club, teen club. Uh, but also there's the, the ladies' rubies class, again, for those ladies age 20 to 35, if you're interested. We have a class right back there right before the teen room. Uh, several ladies have been going to that class, seem to really be enjoying that. So I'm excited about that ministry there as well. Wednesday, also at 1 o'clock for our ladies. Any lady, if you're interested, even if you need to bring your children, they have coffee at Big B at 1 o'clock on Wednesdays. And then... Um, Let's see what else is coming up here. November the 5th, so next week, Saturday. You're going to love next week, Saturday. You get an extra hour of sleep, okay? Don't forget to set your clocks back next week, Saturday, or you'll be at church a little bit early, which is fine. I can talk with you if you show up early. Uh, but also, let me remind you, don't stay up an extra hour because you have an extra hour of sleep. That's just a waste of time, okay? Uh, but that's next week, Saturday. November the 12th also will be... Uh, 50th wedding anniversary for Joe and Cheryl Strauss here at the church. Uh, again, they're they invited the entire church. We'd love to have you here. That is at 1 o'clock on Saturday, November the 12th, from 1 until 3. And then uh, 19th, ladies' shopping trip to Darlington. And then uh, you see the other things that Pastor Ryan mentioned. I think that's everything. We are having a baptismal service right after the morning service. Uh, if you could stay, we'd appreciate that. It won't take very long, but uh, we have one person who's following the Lord in Believer's Baptism. So we're excited about that. It's a good day today. Okay. All right, this time if we'll have the ushers come, we'll go ahead and take up uh, the morning offering. All right. Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you so much for loving us. Thank you again for a day set aside to worship you. And thankful again, Father, that we can give back that, that which you blessed us with. And I pray that you help us to do that uh, cheerfully out of an obedient heart to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Praise the Lord. We have somewhere to go when life gets too much. Our next song that we're going to sing this morning, thank you, Ms. Pendle, for that. And the next song is How Can I Fear? When shadows fall and the night covers all, there are things that mine eyes cannot see. I'll never fear, for the Savior is near. My Lord abides with me. How can strength of my friend he walks along with me how can I fear Jesus is near he ever watches over me worries all cease he gives me is king he controls everything he is with me each night and each day I trust my soul to the Savior's control he drives all fears away how can I fear Jesus is Amen. If you're able to stand, would you stand me? Stand with me as we sing our next song, our final congregation, Near to the Heart of God. Jesus 
blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us awake before Thee, dear to the heart of God. Amen. You may be seated. so much young people for that uh, I love that song it's a great song what a great challenge it is to our hearts there is no higher calling than to serve the Lord and again that's not just for those in full-time ministry that's for every born-again believer we are called to serve our Lord and thank you young people appreciate that if you are four years old up to the sixth grade you can be dismissed for children's church four years old up through the sixth grade <clears throat> try to um, not focus on the scratching of my voice, okay? Just listen to the message and we'll see what we can get through, okay? If, if I have to whisper at the end, you just have to listen a little harder, okay? All right, so we'll, we'll do the best we can there. We're going to talk this morning about something that's relevant uh, to each and every one of us here. And the moment we talk about it, some of you are going to just dismiss what I have to say right away. Um, but you need to listen, not what I say, but what the scriptures have to say. And we're going to be talking about the biblical principles of voting this morning. The vote is just around the corner for us here, uh, a week from Tuesday. And every born-again believer, everybody who's over the age of 18, should exercise their right to vote. Okay? 
1883, in Allentown, New Jersey, a wooden Indian, the kind that was set in front of cigar stores, was placed on the ballot for Justice of the Peace. The candidate was registered under the fictitious name of Abner Robbins. When the ballots were counted, Abner won over incumbent Sam Davis by seven votes. A similar thing happened in 1938. The name Boston Curtis appeared on the ballot for Republican commit committee men from Wilton, Washington. Actually, Boston Curtis was a mule. The town's mayor sponsored the animal to demonstrate what that people know very little about the candidates. He proved his point. The mule won. Now, we laugh at that, but that's sad. Yeah. Okay, that's sad. I mean, I, I thought it was funny, too. I'm not picking on you for laughing because I laughed as well. But, you know, there's no difference between, uh, what was that, 1938 and 1883 than 2022. There are some people who simply vote because of some party. They don't stop at all to think about and look at what that person represents. And before you just dismiss already, let's look at what the scriptures have to say, because ultimately we answer to God when it comes to us voting. Take your Bibles if you want to turn to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Again, probably a very familiar passage of scripture. Uh, we will mention other passages of scripture along the way, but we will begin with Romans chapter 13. And let's go ahead and read the first seven verses this morning. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay you tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. As we begin this morning looking at uh, uh, principles of voting, there are some people out there, I, I find it hard to imagine Christian people, who feel that Christians have no business in politics, even voting or otherwise. But that's not what Scripture teaches us. Okay? We ought to be involved in politics. We ought to take the right to vote. Why? Well, number one, we have a responsibility to vote. Why, why do you say that? Because we are commanded to obey those in authority over us. Look again at verse number one. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Look, it's our responsibility as Christians, as born-again believers, to be good citizens of the United States, and it is to obey those in authority over us. Okay, We are commanded to do so. So if you don't vote... You're not fulfilling your responsibility because God is going to ask you and he's going to command you to obey those in authority over you. Why do I want to obey somebody over me if I didn't vote for them? Now, before you say, well, I didn't vote for who's in office now, well, that's not the point. We'll get to that in just a moment, okay? Because there are scripture, uh, scripture principles to follow in that aspect of the person who was put into offices that you may not have voted for, okay? But let's look as we continue on. Now, the person, <clears throat> again, we are, I believe, commanded to obey, but not when God's word is contradicted, okay? Right. Let's remember that, okay? We need to keep that focus there. We are to obey all those in authority over us, but, and I'm not talking about your opinion, but we're talking about violating Scripture. Right. If they're opposing Scripture, all of a sudden, you know, we don't have to obey at that point, okay? If there's a clear violation of Scripture, remember, in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. <clears throat> now, I hope and pray we never have to deal with this in the United States. I hope they don't come to us and tell us you can no longer gather together at this church. Well, I don't care what the authority says. We are to obey God because that's a very clear contradiction of Scripture, and you should be here. Yes, even if that means you have to go to jail. I'll be there with you, okay? 
Don't decide that you're not going to show up and I'll be the only one in jail, all right? Okay, uh, don't do that. Now, that's something simple. And again, hopefully that never happens. here. But persecution is coming our way. We know that. Amen. Maybe, just maybe that'll be the case. Maybe we'll be forced, uh, similar to be doing what, what uh, other countries have to do, having to meet in private, in secrecy, so we aren't uh, being uh, uh, persecuted. That may be the cause, but we cannot just say, I'm no longer going to church. Can't do that. Amen. Obey those in authority as long as God's word is not being contradicted. Notice verse number five, too. We ought to, again, be voting okay, and obeying those for our conscience sake. Look at verse number five. Wherefore, you must needs be subject. There it is again. We're commanded to obey, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. We just established very clearly that God commands us to obey those in authority over us. When we decide that we're not going to obey those in authority over us, again, providing it's not contradicting Scripture, then you know what? That's not a good conscience on our part because we're disobeying God. We need to have a right testimony. And yes, we may not always approve of everything that people that are in office, but if they're not violating Scripture, we have responsibility and for a clear conscience sake to obey. Okay, very clearly stated in Scripture. So that's one thing, obedience. We need to take the responsibility to vote. Here's another thing. We have an opportunity to place somebody in office. That's why you ought to vote. We have that opportunity. Some countries don't have privileges like that. Here we have an opportunity, and again, we're commanded to obey, so why not obey somebody that we can put in office? Perfect. Doesn't that sound great? It's a whole lot easier for me to listen to somebody. And again, that doesn't matter, by the way, okay? I still need to listen regardless, but it's a whole lot more joyful when I'm listening to somebody who believes like I believe, who wants to do the same things I want to do, as somebody who I voted in office, okay? Proverbs 29, verse 2 says, When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Yeah. We have a great privilege in this country to vote. <clears throat> and by the way, don't just vote during presidential elections. I mean, you ought to vote then, but there are other times of voting that we need to take part in and have a say in, okay? We have that opportunity, so let's vote. Again, it, it, it just frustrates me when Christian people say, well, I'm just not going to be in politics. I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to. Shame on you. You're going to sit around and you're going to complain about having to obey those in authority over you. Hey, look, maybe your vote would have changed things. Think about all the people who claim to be Christian in the United States alone. Could you imagine the number of ballots that would be cast for Christ by Christian people to get place people in office if they would all get out and vote? Amen. Even just the people that claim to be Christian here in Stark County. I wonder how many of them are going to actually show up to vote a week from Tuesday. It's important, and we have an opportunity, and we want peace. We want to rejoice in, in, in this country. We need to vote with proper people in office. Here's another thing. Responsibility vote, because you have, you have an opportunity to oppose those that are in office. Now, I didn't say rebel against those in office. I didn't say not obey those, but we have a right to oppose those that are in office. And again, scriptural principles. In Mark chapter 6, verse 18, for John, John the Baptist, that is, okay, had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. What was it that he was doing? He was opposing those that were in office. He didn't say take him out and hang him. He didn't say take him out and stone him. But he did oppose him because of sin in his life. We have the right to do that. And we ought to do that, folks, Okay. We don't just believe everything that somebody says, again, without searching the scriptures. Amen. Now, that's the next very thing we're talking about here when it comes to vote. You need to do your research. <coughs> right here. Okay. Right here, we have this out there at the Welcome Center, 2022 Voter Guide. And I encourage you, if you haven't taken this at and looked at it, you need to look at it. Gives you there the position and places of, of people and what their vote or what, what their stance is, and you need to look at that. 
It's important. Of course, we have the internet. You can look online and stuff. But it's important that we do our research. So who should we vote for to begin with? Who knows? Nobody wants to answer because you're afraid you might get it wrong. I'll pick on a kid that can't, a teenager that cannot vote yet. But one day they'll vote. Jackson, who should we vote for first? What's that? <laughs> okay. uh, He's not in this election, okay? Uh, but, but the point is this. Okay. Oh, Paige, you have an answer? Okay, you're close. Very, very close. That's on the list, and we're going to get to that. Just minute. If you didn't hear what she said, I'll tell you in a moment. But the person we should be looking for to vote for first is who? A believer. If there is a truly born-again person running for office, that ought to be the person that we are looking to vote into office, okay? Now, is that always the case? No, that's not always the case. Now, when I talk about, again, being a born-again believer, that's what I mean scripturally, born again. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Gene. I appreciate that, okay? It must have really been getting bad for him to listen to me. It's a time for water. <clears throat> Sorry. You just keep thinking you're going to be getting better the next day, better the next day. And then, uh, you know, of course, I wasn't about to call Pastor Ryan this morning and tell him, hey, you got to preach this morning. I wouldn't do that to him because okay, I wouldn't want somebody to do that to me. Okay? I'll try to slow down a little bit if that helps. But uh, it's important. So let's continue on. Okay? A believer. Okay? Not just somebody who's religious. There are a lot of people out there who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Based on what? And it's important for us, to, if we can, to find out their testimony. They talk about, you know, a member of such a church, or I've been in church since the day I was born. Uh, uh, whatever, I'm a member of this church, I give money to this church, I've been baptized. Whatever the reason. If there's nothing there that says to, that says to you and I that, hey, I was a sinner, separated for God. But I know that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, shed his blood for me. And all I had to do was call upon him and he saved me. Okay? We need to hear something like that. We need to be looking for a believer, if at all possible, who's running for office. Proverbs 11.10 says, When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. Righteousness, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 34, Proverbs. Righteousness exalteth a nation. We don't always have that privilege of having a believer run. But when there is one running, that's all the more reason you ought to get out and vote for that person. To have somebody in office, as Paige said a minute ago, who has some of the same philosophy and principles that you have. But that doesn't come without research. you got to know what, who people are and what they stand for. So that's the number one, I believe, qualification when we're looking to vote for somebody. Number two... Uh, basically goes along with what, what, what Paige said, biblical standards. Let's find somebody who has biblical standards. Now, here's an interesting thing. Do you know that there are some lost people who have biblical standards and they don't even know it? But their position backs up biblical principles. You know what? And that's who we ought to be looking for. If there's not a clear-cut believer, we're looking for the next person who has some biblical standards, whether they're aware of it or not. Now, there are lots of Biblical things we could be looking at, but let's just look at some things that we know that is happening in our world today. Uh, number one, a biblical principle is safety of its citizens. If we have people who are trying to defund police and do away with military and, and corrupt our justice, why would we want anybody like that in office? Because your safety is on the line. It is important for us to, again, back somebody who believes, again, that there is safety if we have proper authorities and justice in our country. In Proverbs chapter 20, in verse 18, it says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice, make war. Now, before I mention that, let's read the next couple of verses, Luke 14, <clears throat> verses 31 and 32. Or what king going to make war against another king set it not down first? And consult with whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that comes against him with 20,000. Or else while, he, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador and desires conditions of peace. I don't think anybody wants war. Okay, I, I would hope that's the case. If we have somebody who's running a, a, for some office and he's all about contradiction and, and getting in your face and looking to fight, that's not somebody we probably want in office. 
We're looking for somebody who wants to have peace. Now, there may come a time where there has to be war. But the verses that we read, like in Proverbs chapter 20, you know, that person has sought peace first. He has sought counsel before he decided that, you know what, for the safety of the citizens of the United States, it is time that we go to war. Not somebody who's looking for war first and then peace later. But somebody, again, who's concerned about the safety of its citizens. What about someone, again, who stands for morality? Stands for morality. Even there are some, again, Christian folks, excuse me, lost folks, who still have some biblical principles in the area of morality. Now, I hate to say it, <clears throat> the vast majority of those folks are probably the senior folks who are on their way you know, to the end of their days, the younger generation doesn't seem to have quite that type of uh, moral stance anymore. Right. Amen. And again, we're elected people in office who want to train our young people not to have moral standards. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Amen. Why would we vote for somebody who doesn't understand that principle? What about... Gender identity. And you know what? It's not gender identity. It's gender reality. Okay, you are either a man or male or a female. You're born that way. Just because at some teenage year or something before that, well, you know what? I just feel like being your guy. I just feel like being a girl today. My emotional side is just coming through. I mean... Uh, that's right. It ain't right. That's right. It ain't right. You know, instead of, instead of patting those people on the back and saying, well, good for you. Good for you. No, it's not good for you. There's something wrong there. And then, you know what? The scriptures are clear on that matter. And I'm sorry. Our politicians today are making this a point of voting. So it is important for us to do the research. I'm not interested in voting for somebody who doesn't see marriages between a man and a woman or the gender identity of male and female because the scriptures very clearly teach that. Amen. If you will, why don't you turn over a couple of pages to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And let's look at verses, let's read verses 24 through 27 again, talking about standards of morality. Romans chapter 1, verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did charge the natural, change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. I'm sorry. Again, we're, we're at the point we're talking about research. For us as believers, we very clearly see here in Romans chapter 1 that the LBGQT, whatever letter you want to put on there is not biblically based and I'm sorry I'm not here to hurt somebody's feelings but again if we're going to vote and have a clear conscience before God I need to vote biblical principles moral standards that are laid out in the scriptures now what if you come to the candidates again and there's no difference in that aspect they all seem to have the same uh, belief in, or no morals or whatever else it may be. But what are we going to do? Not vote? No, we still need to vote. I don't know if, if lesser, uh, lesser of two evils is a proper biblical thing, but how about maybe a, a, the better choice, the one of better character perhaps? In Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. It is important, again, that we do our research. You know, the idea of us voting for somebody just because they're on a certain party side, well, shame on us, okay? Research. To my knowledge, there is no Christian party running for office. 
If there was, that's who we ought to vote for. But there's not that, there's not that party. Yeah. Now, that brings us to the last thing here. And what is our response after the vote? Well, my guy didn't get in office, so I don't have to listen to anything. Well, what do the scriptures teach us? Okay, back in Romans chapter 13. Okay, back in Romans chapter 13. Our response after the vote is to accept those in office. Did you hear that? We need to accept those in office. Why? Well, look at verse number one again. Let it be soul, soul be subject unto the higher powers. Now notice this. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Amen. Do you understand that? Why well, didn't vote for that guy? That guy's not a Christian. That guy has no morals. It does not matter. We still need to accept that person that's in office as God's will. Amen. Okay? Now, before you think about how, why would God allow somebody wicked to be in office, think back to the book of Judges. Think back to the time where, where the children of Israel, God's people, got away from God, and God said, okay, if that's what you want, I'll give you that kind, of, that kind of ruler. And they suffered for many years under that kind of rulership because it's what they wanted until finally they cried out unto God, God, forgive us. We were wrong. We sinned. Then what did God do? Then God put somebody who would deliver them. The same is true for you and I. If we're going to live in a world, where, and I'm sorry, Christians are part of this, but if we are dropping our standards, if we're not living a separated, holy, sanctified life, then God's going to give us what we deserve. Yeah. And then maybe, maybe after years of suffering under that kind of authority, then God will hear our prayers and give us somebody that will be more in line with our viewpoints. But we do know this, God has placed them in office, and we are to accept that, those that are in that office. Second thing, okay, so this person is placed in office, what should I do? Appeal to God. Ask God uh, to help with those in office. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all Men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. We ought to be praying for our government at all times. Even the government that's on the local level. Praying, 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 seeking God. For what? Well, number one, okay, we had a vote. Let's say our vote had nothing to do with uh, there was no Christian person, no person with, with good morals or anything like that. We chose the lesser of two evils. What should we be praying for? That they'd be one to Christ. That's what we ought to be praying for. Every politician, that they may be one to Christ. The politicians are no different than any, or, no, any other ordinary person. They're sinners separated from Christ. And they need to know Christ as their Savior. Now, you and I may not have a, a, the opportunity to reach a politician like we would our neighbor, family member, or person we work with. But certainly there are people around them who have to be Christian. There has to be somebody who's going to cross their path with the gospel. And we need to be praying for that opportunity. We need to be praying that when that time comes, that that person eyes would be open to the gospel, their heart would be open, and that they would see their need of Christ. And that's what we ought to be praying for. Also praying for wisdom. Again, this person here, again, remember, God is in control. Regardless of this person's position on things, pray that God would give them wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God to give it to all men liberally. Let's pray that God would give them wisdom. Not just wisdom in general, but what? Biblical wisdom. We know that they're not going to be looking for the scriptures, the answers to, for any of their problems, but we can pray that God would give that to them. Amen. Pray that the will of God would be accomplished. Pray that God's will will be accomplished again. It doesn't matter who's in office. God can get his sovereign will accomplished. 
In Proverbs 21, verse 1, it says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Anytime man thinks they're in control of things, better beware. Because it is God who is in control. And yes, that person in office may not have anything that we desire. But you know what? God can still use that person. God can use that person to advance his cause. We need to pray for the will of God to be done. We need to pray, just perhaps, that God would withdraw that person from office. I didn't say you. I know we'd like to sometimes, wouldn't we? Ah, we'll just get rid of that person. Not our job. But it is God's job. And if we think that that's the case, you know, we can pray that God would, would remove them from office. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He put it down one and set it up another. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 21. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth the kings and setteth up the kings. You know what? If we're not happy with the way things are, we ought to be praying, remember praying, first of all, that they'd be one to Christ, okay? Praying for wisdom. Praying that God's will would be done. Maybe God's will is not to have them be removed from office. But maybe it is. And we need to pray that God would remove them from office. Now, whether God does it his way or through the next election. But we pray along those lines. Amen. Accepting, again, what is our, uh, our response after the vote? Accept those that are placed in office. And then number two, I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 19. Last thing we'll look at this morning, John chapter 19. And, and I hope this will cause you to really think about what the scriptures have to say, the principles that are here in the area of voting. Okay? In, in John chapter 19... <clears throat> This is where Christ is about to be crucified. Look at verse number 11. Then Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Now notice in the last half of this verse. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Pilate is not excused from his sin. But what Christ does say is this, those who delivered me to you have the greater sin. Now think about that. As we apply this principle, who puts people in office? We do. We get to vote. So the next time we're thinking about voting, and if we throw out our responsibility vote, if we throw out our research to vote, and we put somebody in office who's against everything uh, that God has when we could have chosen somebody else, you know what? We have the greater sin. Because we put them there. Now think about that. God holding us accountable for our vote. And the sad truth is, some people, again, do not look at scriptural principles before they vote. And again, right now, for the most part, we're living still in a country where uh, uh, some things are pretty, pretty opposite from one another. Again, I do believe, I do believe, and God uh, help us when the time comes, but I do believe that those lines are going to get real blurred before real, real long, okay? It's going to be hard to tell whose party of what party because they're both going to believe a lot of the same stuff. But for right now, let's think about that before we vote. Vote. If I vote somebody that's totally against what God would have, when I could have voted a different way, I believe God will hold us accountable for that. Someone said this. God is sovereign. God is in control. Let us pray for the election. Let us do our part in voting as responsible Christians. And then let us trust God with the results. And how true a statement that is. Let's do our part. We're praying, okay? We're we're, we're going to exercise our right to vote. We're going to research, and then we're going to cast our votes. And you know what? We're going to respond in a Christ-like manner after the vote, whether it's the person we voted for or not. 
Because God is in control. You know, oftentimes, again, we want to vote for the person who's going to, who's going to line our pockets with more money. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter. God said he'll provide all our needs. Okay, so let's not be thinking along those lines. Let's try to be thinking, researching biblical principles before we vote. Okay? All right. I hope that encourages I hope you just didn't tune me out because you vote the way you always vote. But what does Scripture say? Everything in life, we again feel has the answers are found in Scripture, and I believe the same is true when it comes to voting. Okay, well, let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. Maybe you're here today, and you don't know Christ as your Savior. I'm not asking if you've been to church. I'm not asking if you're a member of church. I'm not asking if you've even been baptized. I'm asking if there's been a time in your life where you know that you have called upon the name of Christ to save you from your sins. And if you were to die this very moment that you spent eternity in heaven, you know that beyond any shadow of a doubt. That's great, and I'm excited about that, but maybe that doesn't describe you. Maybe there's a little bit of a doubt. Maybe there's a little bit of uncertainty. You're the one I'm talking to this morning. 